All right. We're live. We're live on Myth Vision. Hope everybody's doing good. Hope you're having a wonderful evening. Let's get the party started. <laughs> we are Myth Vision. Dr. M. David Litwas joining us again this week. How are you, my friend? Great, great. I hope everybody's well. Thanks, Derek, for having me back. It's great to be back. And um, yeah, everything's going well. You? I'm doing great. Working my tail off as usual, having fun, doing shows. Want everybody, uh, as they tune in, I'm going to mention this again later on in this episode. But uh, Dr. Litwa took a kind of a ding recently with all the uh, drama that happened here on YouTube. Uh, lost a few Patreon members, and um, Myth Vision has been a huge part of trying to help him grow this. So he has, for those who want to join, what's the name of the tier, the fourth level? So you are God, tier number four. Um, and I'll send the first two patrons who, who join that tier a uh, copy, a uh, paperback copy of 2021 Post Human Transformation. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it'll be a quick read, but normally this guy is like, 40 bucks even on paperback so <laughs> so you have a couple um, sitting around that you're willing to throw out if someone joins the you are god tier absolutely you can look it right here you are a god well uh hopefully we can get some people to join um especially when you took a stand with me of course um you would have taken a stand regardless at the end of the day but um everything worked out the way it did we lost a little bit of support in the process but i'm hoping some Good Samaritans out there will recognize that, jump in, and of course, they'll get the blessings from someone who has true gnosis and uh, do that. Also, he has plenty of books. So we will come back to the Patreon at some point later in the episode for those who are chiming in. But uh, lots of books. I'm rereading Yes, this is. I, I must. It's, it's just, I mean, when you told me to reread it, I went to the chapter on resurrection and I just was like, <sighs> because... It's like you say so much in like a you have to pick apart the things you're saying. There's so much in it and um, highly uh, recommend this, especially if you're trying to understand. Was there a zeitgeist for people who thought this way? Is Christianity completely unique and there's nothing like it in the air? No, no. Um, this is Greco Roman. It is there, ladies and gentlemen. Open your eyes. You know, when the apologist wants to say to you, you have no moral standards, you borrow from us. Just say to them, my friend, you borrow from the Greco-Romans. It's okay. We borrow from each other. whoop de freaking do Anyway, uh, there's my shout out for your books. Anything you'd like to say about your books here? <laughs> no, no. I mean, you know, Wendy's borrows from McDonald's too. Uh, and probably McDonald's borrows from Wendy's. So we have to be... <laughs> Uh, very careful. Um, oh, man. Anything else about the Patreon before we move into this? I want you to do your opening and we will have some fun. Yeah, so we've got um, the book Found Christianities. Uh, I've got, I, I don't know, I haven't counted them, but I, I think it's about uh, 21 episodes. And then uh, for uh, this Nagamati series, which I'm doing, I've got now about 20. 20-ish videos up there. We're looking at every book in the Nagamati library, which for most people is like opening up a box of treasure that you've never heard of before. So uh, come join us. Um, and uh, I, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised and well-informed. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Now it's your presentation that you're going to give, which is going to take so long I mean, a whole no, like 120 seconds or something like that, I think, right? <laughs> no, yeah, absolutely. So I, I'm i just going to very quickly show you. We're going to focus today, hopefully, on Alexandria. Now, I should say I'm happy to receive questions about, about everything, but Alexandria is like this centerpiece of Christian uh, gnosis, uh, 
very famous town, East meets West, crazy things are happening. Christian speculative theology is born in Alexandria. So where most of this stuff originates that we think of as this esoteric, these esoteric variants, the uh, alternative Christianities are exploding or at least informed by the theology coming out of Alexandria. And as Walter Bauer you know, said uh, famously back in 1934, one of the reasons we don't know hardly anything about the earliest history of Alexandria is because the Orthodox buried it. And I'm writing a book right now on uh, basically whether that's the case. But just to give you an idea of, of texts claimed to be written in Alexandria, okay, I've collected a bunch of these, and I've highlighted the ones that I think are the best case scenario, okay? So when you think of Alexandria, you can think also of these texts, and I argue, I make arguments for their Alexandrian provenance um, in the book. But we have Jude, the letter of Barnabas to Peter, preaching of Peter, you might not have heard of that one, the apocalypse of Peter, you also might not have heard of that one. That one's fun. The Gospel According to the Egyptians. I talk about that in Found Christianities. The concept of our great power. This is a fun text, which we'll talk about in the Nagamani series. Exegesis of the Soul. The Gospel of Thomas, I think is Alexandrian. A lot of people think it's Syrian. I think that that's not correct. The Authoritative Teaching. That's in Nagamani. Second Treatise of Great Seth, also in Nagamani. Sentences of Sextus, Testimony of Truth, and Eugnostus. Got episodes on all of those in the Patreon. The Wisdom of Jesus Christ. Recently, it's been argued that the Gospel of Truth was first written in Alexandria. The Apocryphon of John, which we just did an episode in Gnostic Informant. The Acts of John, the Proto-Evangelium of James, and the Coptic Apocalypse of Peter. So, and this is only a taste. So when you think of early Christian culture in Alexandria, you know, it's actually not the case that we have nothing. It's simply that these texts are disputed and scholars argue about where they're coming from. But for these texts, there have been arguments made by good scholars that these are Alexandrian texts. Mm. Mm, 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 mm. So this is the presentation, huh? <laughs> That's it. We're done. Wow. So okay. So questions. <laughs> you're, you're technically what you're doing is you're actually you're highlighting these texts. And one of the things I was wondering, Second Peter three, if I could ask, I'd like to ask, and and maybe we'll go ahead and come back to you and me, and our, I'll just show our faces again. Um, what what gives it away that you think this is Alexandrian? I mean, it it, it obviously is dealing with the Feld Apocalypse. Um, didn't Eusebius himself say this probably wasn't written by Peter? I mean, I think one of the church fathers was like, I don't think Peter wrote this, something like that. But how do you, what gives it away that you think it's from Alexandria? Well, Jude and Second Peter are connected. So yes, Eusebius writing in the early fourth century, okay, mm -hmm. father of church history says, yeah, these <laughs> books aren't canonical. These are disputed. He puts them in the disputed category because they have no early citations, right? Which indicates that they're late. The first person to mention Jude is Clement in Alexandria. The first person to mention to Peter is Origen in third century, also Alexandrian. So we know that the texts are there, then they're there late. You know, these, <laughs> these aren't, you know, cited in the first century or even the early second century. They're, they're cited in the late second century and early third century. And we can locate their citations in Alexandria. Now, Jude, yeah, I, I mean, there's, for, for both Jude and Second Peter, the case is dependent because as uh, many of you will know, Second Peter basically plagiarizes most of Jude. Okay, now in the ancient world, they didn't call it plagiarism, but yeah, yeah, yeah. that entire section of dealing with the opponents, you know, those those people who, you know, are given all these terrible, terrible epithets, you know, that they are blemishes in your love feasts, withered trees and clouds without rain, you know, all of that is taken over by the author of Second Peter. And what we see is this, the argument for the Alexandrian provenance 
for for Second Peter really starts with the Apocalypse of Peter. And since you're, I'm not sure how much your viewers know about the Apocalypse of Peter, but the Apocalypse of Peter is the first tour of hell. Okay, and it it is basically the first time that Christians write a text somewhat like Dante's Inferno, where they say, here are all the other people being tortured in hell and how they're being tortured in hell. Mm. It's a tour, you know, it, it's, 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 it's that kind of a text, <laughs> but it's our earliest instance of that text. And because of the Orphic imagery that we find in that text, it's a pretty good sign that it is uh, dependent on uh, traditions in Alexandria. Uh, one of the smoking guns here is also how authors treat first Enoch and material from Enoch. Your viewers will know that Jude is the only text to openly quote first Enoch, or the only New Testament text to openly quote first Enoch as scripture. And when you look at, you know, the early cases where where are writers quoting first Enoch as scripture? Well, the only place, the only attestations we have firmly for that is in Alexandria, because Origen does it, and the letter of Barnabas does it. And for Barnabas, that's, it. I mean, he, traditionally Barnabas is also Alexandrian, and we can talk about reasons for that too. When you hop over to Tertullian, Tertullian quotes, he wants to quote for Sinach as scripture, but he has to make this argument and saying like, Listen, guys, I know you don't think First Enoch is scripture, but I'm going to tell you that it is, and I'm going to use it. So that tells us that is his audience is different, right? Mm -hmm. So in the in Alexandria, you can pick up a copy of First Enoch in in the in the library and and start quoting it as scripture, and people will be like, or Christians will be like, uh huh, yep, that's scripture. That happens nowhere else. And Jude just picks up First Enoch, quotes it, and says, this is scripture. Now, when you get to Jerome hundreds of years later, Jerome says, I can't believe Jude quoted First Enoch. That's not scripture. Therefore, right. Jude can't be scripture. <laughs> you know? oh. and, and, that's, and that's the argument that you find even today. But in second century Alexandria, absolutely, First Enoch is scripture. So there is your smoking gun. Mm, mm, mm. So we have some questions already. I like to kind of allow people to come in and ask whatever they can super chat questions and stuff. It uh, keeps us doing what we're doing and get people educated on these topics. Some really interesting questions already coming up. So first things first, our boy, Nasa conformant, Neil, shout out to Neil, go subscribe. You should know by now he's like my Didymus Thomas. Okay. Um, literally. Hey, Dr. Litwa, do you think Philo of Alexandria plays a role in Christian theology and why? Absolutely. It's irrefutable uh, that Clement of Alexandria quotes Philo hundreds of times without letting you know that it's Philo or only sometimes letting you know that it's Philo. Origin of Alexandria takes his entire scriptural al allegorical program from Philo of Alexandria. Philo is and remains one of the best allegorizers ever. And this allegorical technique becomes distinctively Alexandrian, although uh, other people use it. The people who become most famous for Christian allegory, both of so-called Old Testament and New Testament, are Clement of Alexandria and uh, origin of Alexandria, but long before them, it was used by Valentinus, born in Egypt. Basilides, also Alexandrian. It was used by uh, the Nasim preacher, okay, whom I also place in Alexandria, and I'll tell you why. So, absolutely, Philo and his library is preserved by Christians in Alexandria. That's why we have it. He's absolutely documentably uh, an, an influence for early Christian theology. Clip that right there. <clears throat> Thank you so much for that. Thanks, Neil. Rob. Yeah, Neil. Hey, shout out. Seriously, I'm going to mention this throughout this show. 
go join Dr. Lit was a uh, Patreon. He took kind of a, a, a hit uh, in terms of a few patrons leaving. He took a stand with me on Myth Vision recently. And um, also he has a lot to offer. He, he has paperbacks. He's going to send two paperbacks to people who joined the You Are a God uh, tier. And if you join now, he will mail you the book. So uh, consider joining. Robert Herring. Okay. <laughs> right, we will obviously at the end, I'll make sure everybody is aware of this as well. I'll show it all on the screen because we already went through it at the beginning. Robert Herring, good to see you here, my friend. Join Dr. Litwa's Patreon. Well, well worth it. Thanks, Thank Robert. You. For real. Thank you. It means a lot to me when people treat my guests that way and, and show that. Because uh, you are dropping great, great insight. So I, I, I really appreciate it. Doc Pleromonade is back. And you know when he comes, just... <laughs> Get your Adderall out or find something that's going to stimulate you so you can answer this question. Um, that's a compliment, so don't take it uh, any way bad. Why does Eusebius avoid Demetrius or his successor Peter, spat with Alexandrian Christianity and origin? He's even mum on Methodius attacks and has Eustithius exiled. I don't even freaking know half these names man there is a reason why play romanot is dr play romanot um so <laughs> this <laughs> this is really a case of of high high knowledge so i and i can only answer this partially because actually i'm not even an expert on you know third and fourth century i'm focused on first and seconds but i'll answer what i what i can here so um Eusebius actually, he, I wouldn't say that he avoids Demetrius. So, uh, and, and the, sh the spat being referred to here is that Origen cuts his balls off, okay? And as you can imagine, this caused some, um, uh, shall we say, uh, some initial uh, raised eyebrows among the Alexandrian community. Um, here's a guy who cuts off his testicles. Demetrius, who takes power about 189, gets wind of this, and he's like, okay, cool. I uh, This is fine. We can now, you know, we'll feel free to give you women disciples now because we're not worried about anything bad going on. So um, basically, though, 20 years later, Origen gets ordained in Palestine, and Demetrius blows a fuse because he considers Origen his little pawn in Alexandria. And then he tries to get Origen excommunicated. And one of the reasons that he tries to not only get Origen excommunicated, but kicked out of the city of Alexandria is because he has his balls cut off, which he did, you know, in his late <laughs> teens or early 20s. Do you think and it's historically reliable that happened? Absolutely, I do. Okay. And the reason okay. being is because Eusebius is the one informing us of all this. And for Eusebius, Origen is his hero. So okay. Eusebius is the one trying to backpedal and say, listen, guys, I know he cut his balls off, but it was just a youthful mistake. OK, and he was just trying to be a good boy and not get into any kind of sexual escapades and Here's where we get, you know, and Demetrius is being a little bit of an a-hole because at first Demetrius is like, I'm fine with this. But then when Origen gets authority from the Palestinian uh, churches, oh, all hell breaks loose. And he says, you can't be a priest. You are, you don't have balls. Sorry. I mean, and of course he thinks of other <laughs> theological reasons. Right. Uh, right. But that was a big one. Yeah. Cause this, uh, the script, the Hebrew scriptures, right? Yes. Be, well, yeah. I mean, that's kind of like it, it, it absolutely. I mean, it's a lowbrow exegesis, right? Yeah. Because because Levitical priests can't have crushed or cut off balls. Therefore, right. Christian priests can't have cut what off balls. What about the Ethiopian unit, though? Like, Exactly. That's why I say it's a lowbrow exegesis. It's, it's right. just self-serving and saying, well, you know, it, it's sort of like today, you know, saying, well, you know, women can't be priests because 
Jesus was a man, you know. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And he only chose men, which is a which is a bald faced lie. OK, first of all, uh, as his uh, as his disciples. So anyway, it's, it's a lowbrow exegesis, pathetic reasoning. Um, the reason why Origen cut his off, cut off his testicles, was because he was ascetic, and he thought that sex was a distraction, and that's it. And the, and and the church that he operated in in Palestine also didn't have a problem with it. There you go. So that they answered everything because. I just wanted to make sure. Well, so I didn't touch on Methodius and Eustathius, uh, but I think probably I'll have to punt on that. And uh, because I, uh, Methodius, just to give your viewers uh, a little bit of a taste, is becomes an opponent of origin in the third century. Okay. And uh, for Eustathius, Eustathius, I believe, is fourth century, and I don't actually know much about him. So this is a case where Dr. Pleromonat is more of a doctor than I am. So I, I'm not even going to touch that. Um, but thanks so much for the super chat. Doc, thank you so much, man. Really appreciate that. You always come up with words that I don't know how to pronounce. So <laughs> thank you. Hello, Waits. I really appreciate the super chat. 50. Thank you. I really appreciate that. The show must go on. Bob was the gate for me to myth vision. Keep it up. I think that's a keep doing what I'm doing. Uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Hell awaits. Seriously. Um, thank you. Yeah. I, I don't know. Uh, no questions. So just a statement. I appreciate that. Love Robert Herring. Thank you for the $2. Please compare Aramaic for Q Enoch to the Ethiopian. So I'm Robert. I, I, I'm actually not entirely sure how to interpret your question. So, do you mean, and I'm not sure if you're able to. I'll to look down at the bottom. Privately message uh, Derek. But do he you won't mean, be able to private. He could just comment it. I'll keep an eye open right now. Do you mean Ethiopic? Um, or do you mean the Ethiopian eunuch? Or I'm not, I'm actually not entirely sure where you're going with that question, Robert. But I, I want to give it. I was just going to say, I think, uh, isn't it the case that the Ethiopian church kept one Enoch is canonical from day one and never changed it. And I think he's trying to compare okay. the Ethiopian church's first Enoch to the Aramaic 4Q Enoch. I don't know if there's a way to, I think I could be wrong. Robert, okay. correct me if I'm wrong on that. Well, if that's your question, Robert, then yeah, we have reason to believe the Ethiopic version of first Enoch. Okay. Which is our only complete version is reasonably correct. And that Aramaic fragments that we found in the Dead Sea Scrolls basically confirm what we have in the Ethiopic. In other words, there's no tremendous variation, which would make us think that First Enoch was uh, radically changed between, say, 2nd century BCE and uh, 4th century CE. So that's why Qumran is so important, because it, it confirms you know, for texts like Isaiah and other things, that these right. texts had a fairly stable transmission history. So you should, you know, we should be skeptical, I think, about copying in general, but we can't right. be unreasonably skeptical and say that, oh, well, anything that's copied, um, you know, has to be entirely corrupt. So um, I hope that gets to what you're interested in, Robert. Um, but if yeah. not, just come back. Yeah, he just said limited space to type the Dead Sea text versus Ethiopic. So, yep. Very similar. Very similar. Thank you for that, Robert. Why so religious? Good to see you here. It's been a minute. Have you heard James Snap argument against John's missing verses from Alexandrian and oldest manuscripts? If so, may I hear your response? So I have not heard of James Snap um, specifically or his specific uh, argument, um, but I can say a little bit about um, what some scholars refer to as the, the Alexandrian text type. And I can say a little bit about why Alexandria and Egypt in general is so important for all Christian literature, because Egypt is the only place on earth 
that preserves manuscripts because of its desert conditions. So it's the only place in the ancient Mediterranean where Christian manuscripts were preserved and all of the papyri, virtually all of them, come from Egypt, okay? So when you think of the importance of Egypt for, for establishing the earliest texts of any biblical text, you have to know something about specifically Egypt, okay, and, and the Egyptian connection. So the Gospel of Thomas, our three papyrus fragments, all from Egypt. Gospel of Mary, all from Egypt, okay? Obviously, Nagamati is from Egypt. But also other texts which you may not have heard of, the Egerton papyrus, and uh, a lot of unknown papyrus fragments from unknown Gospels, still unknown today, we don't even know what they are, are all Egyptian but the thing to remember here is that although there's textual variation, um, yeah, in general, there's not like this huge, ridiculous textual variation, okay? And sometimes the papyri are actually written poorly in a hurried fashion. So the fact that you've got papyri doesn't necessarily mean that you've got the original text, right? And the other thing to keep in mind is although the papyri are earlier than anything we have. The earliest safe date for any of the papyri is late in the second century. So you'll often see apologists claim that the Rylands Papyrus 52, which is like a credit card sized version of the Gospel of John, chapter 19, is like, you know, the year 100 or something crazy like that. <laughs> that has been proved false in modern scholarship, and you should never accept that. And I highly encourage all, everyone here to, to look up the articles on that papyrus, that's the, the John Ryland's papyrus, sometimes called P52, by Brent Nonbury. Brent yeah, is Brent. an excellent papyrologist and has put the case closed for that papyri. It's not as early as the apologists claim. I need to get him on, by the way. There's so many things I'd love to talk with him about. But thank you so much for that super chat, my friend. I really appreciate it. Why so religious? Now we're back to testing your PhD skills with Doc Pleroma not. And uh, <laughs> thank you, Doc, for the super chat. How do we differentiate mainstreams of Gnostic Pythagorean thought as older schools merged into eclectics? So many shadowy figures like Amanius, Saccas, or Pen Pentinus? Pentinus? Pentinus, yeah. Pentinus. Absolutely. So this is a great question. And this is one of the things where Philo is important because Philo, as has been recently argued, had a doctrine of transmigration. Okay. Now he was very muted about it. Okay. But he had it. And the earliest Christians were highly open to Neopythagorean ideas. They believed in God as a monad, a monad which split into a dyad. And then became a decad. Okay, all of this is Neopythagorean mathematics. A lot of this is distinctly Alexandrian. The doctrine of transmigration is distinctly Alexandrian. The only two Christian theologians to have a strong, vibrant doctrine of transmigration, which is the same thing as reincarnation, is Basilides and uh, Carpocrates. Carpocrates, I've just finished a book on Carpocrates, uh, absolutely brilliant guys. And uh, the, or again, the earliest speculative theologians. There's a quote of Valentinus that, you know, the, what's available in public books is also available to the Church of God. So this is a this is a ecclesial circle. This is a group of Christians who are open, radically open to ideas in the air. And Pythagorean and Neopythagorean math and metaphysics was high, high, high on the list of. Uh, the latest and greatest of theology in the second century. So, um, you know, and the other thing to keep in mind, but this is important for Ammonius Saccus, who's the teacher of Plotinus, and some think he was the teacher of Origen. He is a Platonist, but almost all Platonists during this time are also do double duty for, for Neopythagoreans. There's a, there's a confluence between the Platonist and Neopythagorean thought. Pentinus is usually associated with Stoic thought. We really don't know much about him. Uh, Eusebius claims that he's the teacher of Clement, but 
uh, you should always try to sift anything that you see with sets because um, <laughs> he wants to basically destroy any Christianity that's not his own. So right. uh, something to keep in mind there. What is mainstream in second, early second century, mid second century Alexandria? Mainstream is is thinkers who are serious about engaging with Neopythagorean math and metaphysics. That is a fact. Mm. You guys went deep on that one. Thank you so much, Doc, and uh, appreciate that, Dr. Litla. The Messiah rides a donk. Thank you for the super chat. I always, <laughs> always get a crack out of reading your name. Alexandrians care about wording in Galatians 4.4, 4, Gidemai for Jesus' birth, as did Marius Victor, Victorinus, I'm saying this Victorinus. Right? Victorinus. Mm -hmm. and much later Aquinas and their Latin translations, Vic's manuscript had a, a, a dedum, a didum, establish a Aquinas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Aquinas had yeah. factus. Ex yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, so as I take, I, I, I hope I fully understand you, but the argument would be that, you know, using texts from Alexandria, there is dispute about the exact wording in um, Galatians 4.4. 4, and I'm just going to very quickly uh, get this up myself. So it says, Hada de Elthenta Pleroma Tukranu, that is when there came the fullness of time, uh, ex epistolan atheas tan huia now to God sent forth his son, genomenon ek genekos, genomenon hupenomenon, that is born from woman, born under law. So um, that's genomai, which is which is a fairly broad word, meaning it can mean to be born or just to, to become um, and, or just to happen. So, I mean, if you wanted to play with a Greek and you wanted to translate genomenon ek genekos, you can translate it as born from woman, but you can also translate it as happening from woman, becoming from woman, or something like that. And then later that shows up in, in the Latin where editum est would mean something like produced from woman, and factus est would mean, you know, happening from woman. Because, uh, I mean, these are very general kind of verbs, okay? So I, I guess if, and if I understand the question, I guess if you wanted to, you know, point out that there's ambiguity about birth here um, because of the vague verb ginemai, uh, you could do that. Absolutely. Um, it's not It's not actually the most common word specifically for giving birth. Um, but as far as I can see, and I'll have to look this up <clears throat> in the critical edition, I don't see a huge amount of variation in that actual word. But I also don't have my text open and I don't want to hold down the show, but <laughs> thanks for the question. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Um, thank you so much for that. The Messiah rides on a donk. I appreciate it. I just had to say that again. So thank you so much. Uh, Robert Herring in the house again says, y'all suck me into paying money. I better figure a way to save my <laughs> wife from a hornet. Yesterday, my <laughs> wife called me in the middle of the live. The worst time was it? Yeah. Yesterday. Yeah, we were in the middle of a live, and she had a hornet somehow get in the house. And I'm like, I had to go <laughs> save her, <laughs> bash the hornet on the wall. Um, no, seriously, appreciate the support, my friend, and uh, thank you. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, Robert. Yeah, okay, other text. So if, if you were to, in New Testament text, you just pointed out stuff that's from Alexandria at the beginning of the show. I'm just going with my own questions here at the moment. I didn't see anybody pop up. So um, what other New Testament texts? I mean, is there a single other than the seven of Paul's authentics? Would you say how much of the New Testament is really second century? Would you count the Gospels in this? I mean, how late would you date Mark? Would you go late on Mark? Uh, well... Well, the first thing I'll mention, which maybe not all of your viewers know, is that there is or was, we no longer have it, but we have report of in the Muratorium Canon that Paul wrote a letter to the Alexandrians, okay? Um, which, of course, uh, he never did. But um, uh, maybe somehow there was a text of Paul 
attributed to Paul that was also addressed to Alexandria. Okay, so that's one thing to keep in mind. So that when you're dealing with, you know, the growth of the Pauline letters, obviously uh, in traditional scholarship, there's seven genuine letters, and then there are the disputed. And among those dis disputed are Colossians, Ephesians, and First uh, and Second Timothy and Titus. I, I think it's indisputable that First and Second Timothy and Titus are all second century. Right. They all reflect second century debates and um, the development of the church. So there's three. Um, I think that the canonical Luke is second century. That that I also think that there's a version of Luke written around a hundred. But I think the version of Luke that we have right now is is definitely um, about 150. Um, I think the Gospel of John is arguably a bit past 100 as well, early second century. I definitely think that the prologue of John is early second century, which was attached to uh, the Gospel of John. Um, and, well, let's see, what do we got? I mean, Hebrews, I don't know. I, like the dating game is yeah. kind of up for grabs on that one. Do um, you take Hebrews to be written to Jews or do you think Hebrews is written to an already um, a church that has re-identified itself as the new Israel of God? So really there are no ethnicity markers or you see what I'm trying to say? Um, they're children of Abraham, no matter who you are at this point. How, how do you read Hebrews? I know you're not a Hebrews like expert. Like I'd have Harold Attridge. I had him on the Hermeneia commentary uh, guy, but I didn't know if you had a stance on it in your opinion. Well, I think the, the text to compare with Hebrews here is Barnabas and uh, all your readers should, all your uh, viewers should know Barnabas. Barnabas is a fun text. Um, and it basically says the same thing as uh, Hebrews. It has, it has the same view that, you know, you shouldn't be practicing Jewish rites, but it's using all of this Jewish lore and adapting it and saying that it's, hey, now it's Christian. So we get it. But as for the real Jews, back off. Uh, we don't need you anymore. Um, that kind of attitude um, is pretty much what we find in, in Hebrews. Um, in other words, it's Christians playing the game of, I'm going to take what I want from Jewish lore, but as for actual Jewish customs like circumcision, Sabbath keeping, and, um, you know, kosher, all that's allegorical. <laughs> so right. you know, we're not going to actually do that, but but we have, we, we know the true meaning of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and that's exactly what you find in Barnabas. And everybody, I think most everybody, uh, is very happy. This is the hypocrisy of, of Christian dating schemes, right? Because the apologists, they're very happy to put Barnabas in the second century, but they're not happy to put Hebrews in the second century. <laughs> so, but, but on that score, they're saying exactly the same thing, right? So you should always yeah. be comparing, you know, you'd be comparing with like texts, okay? So it, I again, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, as you note, but I would be perfectly happy setting that in the early second century. There's nothing... This, I mean, there's there's no <laughs> there's no smoking gun here, but because it's so much like Barnabas, I'm happy to put it there. Uh, I think First Peter is definitely early second century. Second Peter is quite late second century. I think past 180. Um, it's the latest of all letters. Um, and Jude, of course, would be early to mid second century, and that's pretty much. Where, yeah, what are, do you put James to, somewhere? James, yeah, everybody wants James to be early. I mean, maybe. Uh, the fact is, you know, when you're dealing with a pseudepigraphon, that is a letter written under a false name, and you have a, a Greco Roman culture that's highly into imitation, you know, a second century writer who wants to imitate what a first century Jew might say, well, they could do that. And very and sound very plausible to us. I mean, let's face it, folks. Think, do this little mental experiment, okay? Say that two thousand years from now, someone wants to, you know, determine whether an undated letter that somebody wrote is from the twentieth or the twenty-first century. And what are their criteria? Well, 
I mean, well, the, we have a highly that. documented society and the way that we, we the, let's say the materials are fragmentary. That would be a whole nother issue, right? Fragmentary. And they don't mention any political events. It's just a letter to your mother. You know, it's like, hi, mom. Today I brush my teeth and had corned beef. And is this from the 20th or 21st century? I, I mean, this is the, this is what we're up against. OK, so making razor sharp determinations of dating first of all your viewers should know that that's never possible and if anybody stands up and says this was written in the year 40 or this was written in the year oh 70, my gosh it's apologetics you, when you hear them you know that. you know to shut your ears and run screaming i mean this is a game of date ranges you notice that on my powerpoint every single text you show it Oh, um, every single go. text on the PowerPoint has a date range, not an exact date. Okay? Right. And all these scholars who have uh, proposed that th these are Alexandrian texts have provided ranges because that's what good scholars do. Bad scholars and apologists pretend that they know or, more than they can possibly know. Or they put that range at like... The Gospel of Mark was probably written in 43 to 47 AD. <laughs> it's like, hold on, man. Like, why are you not even going over 70? Like, they don't even allow it to be like an option of a late date. Some of them. Anyway. Uh, yes. And it was probably written at 545 in the morning after Mark had his <laughs> daily shave um, and his breakfast. So uh, and we can determine what his breakfast was from an allegorical reading of the text itself. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. I, I would ask another one, but we have a super chat. I'm going with Doc over here. One more. Explain the doublets, contradictions in Thomas. Lauding James, but rejecting circumcision. Later attempt to legitimize the hero's authority to mend community rifts via a rolling corpus model. Well, here's where I have a shameless plug and, and invite everyone to join the Patreon because I talk about the Gnostic James, okay? What is happening in Thomas is not a contradiction, in my opinion. It is simply a different version of James. Now, if, if you're reading only traditional scholarship, you're going to look at James and you're going to think, oh, James, he's like the Jewish Christian par excellence, you know, leader of proto-Orthodoxy and you know, ad advising people to get circumcised and the food laws, yada, yada, yada. Not at all. There are different versions of James, okay? And one is the Gnostic James. And that Gnostic James rejects circumcision, as he should. Mm -hmm. um, and that James is the one for whom heaven and earth came into being, you know? That James is the James of the first and second of Apocalypse of James in Nagamadi. There's also an apocryphon of James in Nagamadi. And in each case, that James is a Gnostic knower and passer on of secret information. And that's the James that Thomas is appealing to. It isn't the James saying, All right, guys, we got to be circumcised, bring out the knife. No, it, I mean, it doesn't even mention that because that's not that's not the real James. The false James is the one sending you know, and, uh, and envoys to Antioch and telling everybody, all right, guys, you got to have table fellowship rules and you Gentiles, you know, get uh, that piece of flesh cut off from your penis. And uh, that's because that's the true way, right? And don't eat, you know, meet with the blood. Okay. No, that's not James. Not at all. Not at all. Um, is there an attempt to legitimize this hero's authority? Absolutely, but depends on which James you're trying to authorize because there's different versions of James, just like there's different versions of Peter, just like there's different versions of Paul. And for the rolling corpus model, which is really April Deconic's model, I, um, I would only accept that to a limited extent. Um, I don't think we can really uh, pontificate about yeah, exactly when a particular saying was written, like say, this saying was written in 50, this saying was written in 70, this saying right. was written in 120. Um, I don't think we can do that just because I know how scholarship works and that's a guessing game. 
And sometimes the guessing is educated and sometimes it's speculation. So what we've got in the Gospel of Thomas, the Coptic version, is something written around, you know, finished up about 130 or 140. And then from that, we can start to make solid conclusions. I do want to get a quick uh, question. I hope my super chatters don't mind, but Lauren Jones, you come in all the time, and, and I saw this before we ended up getting the super chats, and I really wanted to ask her question. Does Dr. Litwick think that the letter to Philemon was a direct reference to Ovid's Philemon and Bacchus? They both focus on the importance of hospitality. That's definitely an interesting connection. I mean, the issue is that uh, Philemon, or Philemon if you prefer, is uh, a fairly common name and it's not quite as common as john but it's probably for in the ancient terms it's probably about as common as robert is today um so yeah you wouldn't need to make a reference to ovid uh, i i know in mimesis criticism uh sometimes that you know you're reaching out very very you know eagerly for a greco roman parallel but i think uh, the letter to Philemon really is just basically best read as a historical text about a Christian slave owner. And that's really important because the fact that Christians own slaves is really important to, to understand. And it, it, it undercuts, okay, any, any, you know, modern apologetical claim that Christians were of a higher moral standard, okay? <laughs> in the early period, uh, if they were of a higher moral standard, um, <laughs> they might have freed their slaves. Um, I, so, yeah, I don't, and besides the hospitality bit, really, the problem with Philemon is that he's not hospitable. He's probably an abusive slave owner, and he's so abusive that his slave Onesimus has run away. Mm. So that's not really a story about hospitality, to my mind. But it's an excellent question, and I love thinking in terms of the wider Greco-Roman world. I really commend that. Thank you, Lauren, for that question. Scott Duke in the house. Good to see you, my friend. Thanks for having Dr. Litwa on. Very fascinating. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Thank you. Stay, stay around because he's going to uh, transfigure in front of us, but we can't go and tell anybody about it once, he, once we see it. So... He told me, don't even ask about a tabernacle. Don't even ask. So I'm not. I'm not going to ask. I promise. I think. Uh, <laughs> Alejandro Larco, thank you so much for the super chat. Doctor, I felt like Second Timothy, it's like a goodbye letter. The kind of one you send when you know you're going to die. Too much imagination? Not at all. That letter fits a very strict genre called the last will and testament genre. And uh, anybody who is not going to die can write a letter pretending to be from someone who thinks he's going to die. And it's sort of like, uh, you know, someone writing a drama for like a TV series on like, you know, suspenseful trials, you know, and court courtroom trials. Anybody in the ancient world is trained can be trained rhetorically to write a letter that imitates somebody who is in prison on death row waiting to die. And that's the image of Paul that you get in 2 Timothy. It is completely fake because we don't really know how Paul died. I mean, he might have been hit by a carriage for all we know, or some horse hit him with a hoof and he never made it to Spain, you know? And, and I mean, really we have nothing. Absolutely nothing. So don't be confused even by later church tradition, which has him crucified in Rome or whatever. Or no, sorry, his head gets cut off. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry. Or I mean, the gospel. We don't, what, you know, isn't there the saying that he died from uh, he, like noble women were leaving and not sleeping with their husbands anymore? And the guy's like, nah, let's, we're going to have to take him out for that one. Well, yeah, so that, that, that happens again and again in, in like the Acts of the Apostles literature. Um, absolutely. Um, but I, I think one of the reasons this question is really good is because, you know, good historical fiction brings a tear to my eye, you know, and, and, and Second Timothy still to this very day brings a tear to my eye, you know, where Paul's like, I'm going into the lion's mouth, pray for me, you know, 
bring me the parchments. Uh, bring me that cloak I left in God knows where. I, but bring it anyway. Winter is coming. I'm cold. You know, for someone for someone reading this, like they're like, wow, this must be from the real Paul. Look at this. Look at how detailed this information is. And the poor guy, he's going to die. I mean, am I, you know, I feel like a tear forming here, you know? Yeah. But this is so standard. If you just read a little bit more broadly, you get to see that <laughs> in terms of Greco-Roman rhetoric, they're imitating this last will and testament style all the time. Okay. Here's a letter. I mean, funny, Lucian of San Macedo writes of letters from dead people. Uh, oh, and, and, no way. <laughs> you know, and, and, you, and you read these letters and you start crying, you know, because these people, oh, my God, how, how, tell me how you died. And it's awful. But of course, it's fiction. You know, so I mean, it's, it's all in good. It's all good. Uh, you know, it, it's all good fun as long as you realize what's going on. But if you're sort of like, oh, well, I really believe the historical Paul must have wrote this. It just shows that you've got to read a bit more widely here, folks, in terms of the genre. OK, it's everywhere. Mm. Well put. Well, well put. Thank you for that, Alejandro. And Dan Jacobs, listen, you you are. Look, it Thanks, doesn't matter Dan. what sins you commit. You are forgiven. OK, um, seriously. I just updated it. We got another patron for Dr. Litwa. He lost quite a few patrons in the recent debacle. Thank you for joining. And um, I hope that you get some insight there. I know that anyone who joins his Patreon on the You Are a God tier, which is right here, um, you'll get... Oh, here. Let, I'll let Dr. Litwa show you. I've got two copies of this. It's the paperback of post-human transformation. And I'd if you ask for it and you join tier four, I'd be glad to send it to you. Just keep in mind, yeah, I'm in Australia, so we will get to you. And I've got only got two copies, but they're yours if you want them. Awesome. So tier four, uh, that book is like 40 bucks, buying it right now on Amazon. And this will get you, obviously, the book. You're practically buying the book, but also supporting someone you can ask questions of, uh, you know, stay involved in the conversations because there's all sorts of interesting chats going on under each of his posts as well. And he's involved in the dialogue. So Dan, thank you so much. I really, I mean that like, seriously, thank you for joining and helping support a wonderful guest, Dr. Litwa. And I can't wait to learn more from him. Go back and reread. I'm rereading his book. Yes. This day right now. Uh, there's just a lot of content that when you're engaging with apologists, you just go, are we even reading the same books? Do they even know what they're looking at? It's amazing information. So, Dan, thank you. Like I said, Thanks. you can go and sin and do whatever you want, and you are forgiven. <laughs> I, I always have to do that. These are indulgences here. We sell them, okay? <laughs> and we're shameless at selling the indulgences. So, anyways, uh, moving forward, Jason Sobeck, Lord of the Four Corners, thank you so much for the super chat. What are some of your favorite deification stories in current media? My favorite are the Spawn comics, Ghost in the Shell, and Lego Movie. <laughs> oh, well, thank you so much, Jason. I, I, I'm petrified by this question because it, it will show my vast ignorance of uh, popular uh, pop culture. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, one thing I do try to do in 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 the posthuman transformation book um, is I try to show how common it is in pop culture for people uh, it to be deified or to be angelified. That is to be created in uh, and made into into angels. Um, and really, I, I think most of the Marvel franchise is really based on this idea because. One of the key characteristics of deification is you gain a, a superhuman power. Now, normally, to, to, in order to get into full godhead, you have to live forever. Okay, so you know, unfortunately, Iron Man is mortal. But in in terms of you know, and and, and others are mortal, of course. But there's even a Marvel character called Angel, uh, which is which I talk about uh, here. But 
Um, the, the idea is that gaining a superhuman power is already thinking very much in terms of uh, ancient deification, okay? And we love, in modern culture, you know, we love hearing stories about people who have these superhuman powers and their adventures, you know? I mean, so you can be a Spider-Man fan, you know, the Hulk, uh, you know, I'd even throw in Batman there, although that's a greatly disputed case. But Wonder Woman, obviously, uh, all these characters, and there's so many now, there's so many mm -hmm. uh, on the silver screen, you know, much more than I, you know, am even able to keep up with. Okay. Right. Me too. This idea of enhancing human nature so that it graduates out of human nature and what will that mean for us as people and as for, as a society you know what is your obligation what is spider-man's obligation now that he has superpowers well you know his his dying uncle tells him you know use it wisely basically you know to those with great powers much is expected and that is also a very ancient trope where you know Heracles or Hercules has superpowers and but he, and he sins and in order to pay off his sin he benefits the community and he starts taking care of the weak and the poor and, and he is a superhero for people for normal people and that's just an idea that has intrigued, I think, Western culture for, for millennia. And it's an idea that we see repeated over and over and over again in drama and silver screen. And I can't speak for uh, the recent Lego stuff, but it's everywhere. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was thinking, I don't know why uh, Neo from The Matrix came up. Uh, it's always fascinated me how layered they would come up with that whole matrix stuff. The latest movie disappointed me personally, just because I'm, I don't know. I was expecting beyond, uh, there were some cool things about it, but I was just like, nah, I'm not feeling it. I'm just not <laughs> feeling it. But yeah, I like yeah. the ideas that they had in the previous ones anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't know if you wanted to comment on this. Anyway, yeah, I actually, to be totally honest, I haven't even seen the new Matrix, so I, I can't. Um, but but it it's there, folks. I mean, this i this idea that we must be better, and that with with superhuman power comes superhuman moral responsibility, is really something that is, is so important for us today. Thank you so much. Yeah, we live, we love myths. I mean, what can I say? We love myths. We do. Uh, MPL Cindy, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. I'm probably butchering it. The magical diagrams in the book of J, J E U, Jew? Jew, yeah. Uh, reception. Yeah, that's a good question. You know, there hasn't been a huge uh, reception of the, the book of Jew. This, um, this is not an Agamotti text. It, it was a text found in the 19th century, and it has in, in in the actual manuscript, which is really fun, it has actual drawings. Sometimes these are called magical drawings, but they're they're basically uh, visual passwords and things that you draw in order to sort of harmonize or get into the same wavelength as a as a as a superhuman power and um i you know i mean christians use these symbols um and i think a lot of people use these these kinds of symbols but in terms of the late antique reception and the modern reception yeah this is a this is a really understudied text and um I, I myself, um, because it's usually considered late, I myself haven't done the real research into this one. But I really appreciate the question. And I think everybody, if you can, you know, if you have the interest, go check this out. It's a fun text. And uh, yeah, tell me what you think. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. DJ Frank, good to see you here again. It's been a minute. Please excuse novice question. Were pseudo letters of Paul anonymous letters ascribed to him by others or an author pretending to be Paul? 
Well, this is a really nice question because you know not all pseudo pseudepigraphical letters are the same. Um, sometimes, like take the take the letter to Barnabas, for instance. The letter to Barnabas is called the letter to Barnabas, but if you read the letter to Barnabas, the author never calls himself Barnabas. And so you ask, well, how is this letter called Barnabas? Well, it's because that Clement, when he mentions the letter, says that it's the letter of Barnabas. But in the letter itself, it never says that it was written by Barnabas. The Pauline letters are different. There you have a case where someone is actually trying to pretend to be Paul. And doing that very deliberately because in order to gain authority for the letter itself. Same thing with Second Peter, okay? Second Peter is really, the guy who wrote Second Peter was really trying to pretend to be Peter. And that's one of the factors that got him into the New Testament, right? Because if he just, if he just, you know, published a letter yeah. and without a name or without a well-known name, it wouldn't have made it. You know, I mean, there are too many other problems with the letter. So in order to have apostolic authority, you need to really try hard to create this apostolic identity. And that's what the the writers of First Second Timothy did. It's what the writers of the Colossians and Ephesians did. But the fun thing is you can see how the different attempts to pretend to be Paul resulted in different versions of Paul. So the Colossians, Ephesians version of Paul is very different from the First Timothy, Second Timothy version of Paul. And so the theory then is that there, these versions of Paul by the second century are in, in contradiction and are fighting against each other. It's a battle for the legacy of Paul. And those who are convincing, right, those who can convince you that they are Paul are the ones who, who win. But the interesting thing about the New Testament is it includes letters that contradict each other that both claim to be from Paul and are not. And that's why that's why that the New Testament is itself a redeemable product. You know, it's it's why, you know, you shouldn't really be angry at the canon, canonizing process. Yes, the canonizing process excluded a bunch of texts, but it also it's broad enough to include texts that contradict each other. Mm -hmm. And to tell you that there were Christians who disagreed and Christians who were willing to be dishonest in order to get their version of Christianity, Christianity on top. But they never really succeeded because they never really snuffed out the, the other guy pretending to be Paul. This question, actually, um, it wasn't this question that I had, but in the vein of this, I was going to ask you personally, was, are there any authentic Pauline letters that you doubt that you second guess even now and say, you know, not that you take a strong firm stance since unanimously most scholars say the seven are authentic, but uh, he takes a, takes a sip of the whiskey. No, I'm just kidding. Um, where, <laughs> I wish I had it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> where do you stand on the, the seven? Do you have any that you're highly suspect of or you think, man, I, I just don't know if that's really Paul. Uh, you know, I, I used to used to be just a Pauline scholar. You know, I wrote my first book on Paul, uh, the We Are Being Transformed book. And um, yeah, it's just a very ingrown field. You know, there's people who only do Paul and then you sort of get trapped and sucked into that. And um, I would say there's a lot of people. I, I don't have doubts about the seven. I, I really don't. Um, but there's a lot of people really pushing for Colossians to be authentic. And I think that that's seriously wrong. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, the, the trend today is, uh, uh, certainly among apologists has always been to make, make things seem authentic because they point to, you know, very, you know, details like from Paul's life. And, um, that's not the case because again, just think of historical fiction. I don't want to be overly skeptic, but historical fiction is, you know, you you can write a first person account, you know, so pretending to be Thomas Jefferson. And if you know Thomas Jefferson's writings really, really well, you can pull that off. You can absolutely pull that off today. Mm. And it was, will make immensely enjoyable reading and it will teach you stuff. But it's not true. 
it's 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 a game, right? It, it's a game, and so yeah, I I I'm not interested enough in Paul anymore to really <laughs> examine the question much more closely. But uh, I would be willing to say that whenever you first read this literature, you, it's okay to have your skeptical antenna on, and if you can make a case, right? If you see anything in a letter, like that indicates uh, a later date, like for instance, in, in Philippians, because of it mentions bishops and deacons, is that a, can that be written in the first century? That's a question you should always be asking yourself because maybe not, maybe not, because it takes a while for the churches to get organized into this hierarchical system of, right. you know, bishop up top, you know, presbyter in the middle and deacon on the bottom. And so anybody who is has this rigid sense of, of church structure, like we find in Ignatius, well, that's probably not from the first century. In fact, almost surely not. And that was the real smoking gun for First Timothy. First Timothy 3 is like, okay, you want to be bishop? Here's what you need to do. And boy, I mean, nothing remotely corresponds to the situation anywhere in the first century. So there you go. Thank you so much, DJ Frank 68. Um, thank you, Walka, for the super chat. A little support. Ja Live. Thank you so much for the support. Appreciate the love. You know, one of the questions I was going to ask you is, um, do you think Paul's real name was Saul? I felt like it was a literary thing. Because uh, in Acts is the only place you find it. And it's highly suspect in the context that I see a mimetic uh, connection to the Hebrew text where Paul's converting and hears Jesus literally repeating the phrase, you know, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Which is the same phrase David said to Saul, why do you uh, pursue me? So he's like, Saul, Saul, why do you pursue me? It's the same literary thing. So I'm wondering if Saul has is like a fictional title given to Paul in Acts of the Apostles. So I didn't know if you took a stance on that anyway. Well, when you're determining what looks suspicious, you have to ask the question, qui bono, that is who benefits? Does this make Paul look better or worse? And the general tendency of Acts is to try to make Paul look better, right? So Acts wants to make Paul into a Roman citizen. Is that likely? In my opinion, no, not at all. A million miles away. No, this guy's not a Roman citizen. He gets his ass whooped. You know, I mean, multiple times. He gets dragged into court, thrown into prison. This is not how Romans treat a Roman citizen. And and the author of Acts has to sort of like backpedal and explain why this is happening later on when Paul gets arrested. And he has to tell, you know, the Roman soldier, hey, guess what? I'm a Roman citizen. You got to lay hands off me. And but all that seems very, very concocted and fictional. But if Paul is a Roman citizen, then he looks more like a hero. For Saul, I don't think that makes Paul look like a hero. Um, you may have heard that um, Saulin as a verb in Greek uh, means to, yeah, something like to walk like a pedophile. And so if Paul was really called Saul uh, and the Greeks, you know, her, what the Greeks heard from Saul uh, with something negative, then probably that's not to Paul's benefit. And it's very clear that he suppressed that name in his actual letters. Oh my gosh. Okay. Game of Thrones it is. All right. Uh, <laughs> Bradford Baldwin, thank you for the super chat. And uh, this will be our last super chat. And I'm going to let Dr. Litwa go. We went a little past the hour. I literally didn't even pay attention to the time, Dr. Litwa. So forgive me on that. <laughs> Um, okay. Are there any writings from Paul that didn't make it into the canon Bible, either at the time of canonization or found later? Thank you for the 20, my friend. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, I, I mean, so I, I want to give a, just a little bit of background here because, um, you know, for Christians today, Paul is like, I wrote half the guy who wrote half the Bible and he's the authority. Um <laughs> And that just wasn't the case um, in, in the first and second century. Um, the battle for Paul's authority 
wasn't really one until until the fourth century. So, but b- believe me that early Christians tried, including Marcion, tried to collect all that they had from Paul. Marcion is early, and you can tell he's early because he doesn't hasn't even heard of the pastorals. And then when he does, he doesn't accept them. Um, I did mention that there might have been a letter of Paul to Alexandria, but that's almost certainly fictional. You might be aware that there's a third Corinthians, mm-hmm. also fictional. Um, and there's a number of writings that claim to be Paul, Pauline that, yeah, didn't make it uh, into the into the canon. OK, but but none of them are authentic. But one of the reasons why we really shouldn't care too much is because that even the so-called authentic Paul, he's really not an authority for historians. Like whether you're dealing with the authentic Paul or the fictional Paul, for me as a historian, neither one, you know, is of greater actual authority. Both can be used by me to determine what early Christian history looked like on the ground, right? I don't go to bed at night biting my fingers whether Second Timothy was written by Paul. Um, It wasn't. I mean, (laughs) but I think I I think that Second Timothy is really useful because it shows you that Christians in the mid second century were familiar with Greco Roman culture. They could imitate the last will and testament genre. That they knew how to really expertly pretend to be Paul. That they didn't have a problem with that that they could expand apostolic authority and that apostolic authority was really important to them at that time. Right. And they were willing even to lie about it in order to get their letter past, you know, the the process of assessment. Okay. Paul agrees with us. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So so that's so we should expect there to be a, a large corpus of Pauline writings, most of which is not authentic. Okay. And and that's what we have. And uh, those that made it in, about um, half, well, from the early church perspective, about half are actually written by Paul and half aren't. Because in the early church, they also attributed Hebrews to Paul. Right. And this is another great example of, wow, as times change, even the apologists give up that argument. You know, it's like, you know, a a third century apologist (laughs) might say, yes, Paul wrote Hebrews. But now they're like, eh, I can't even float that, you know, so let's just forget about it. Um, but that's the situation. There's 14 letters. Seven are genuinely considered to be written by Paul and seven aren't. But all 14 can tell us something about early Christianity. And I think at least six or seven of those tell us about early Christianity in the second century. Okay. And that's really where you see Christianity debating about who Paul was and the Pauline legacy. So we did have one more super chat slip in, but I have good news for you in just a moment. Luke, uh, thank you, Margaret DeVelden. I didn't want to leave you hanging. Uh, Thank you for the super chat. Luke has ascension while blessing, but Acts has Jesus' ascension after blessing the followers. Uh, Which came first and why would he make this mistake? This is actually brought up in the debate between Bart Ehrman and Mike Lacona. Uh, At the end of Luke, he ascends. And then in Acts chapter one, it's like, and he spent 40 days with the disciples and whatnot. And then he ascends. So anyway, uh, I don't know if that would be in the same exact place, but. Yeah, that's a key. That's a, it's a key observation. And this attention to detail is really important when you're doing historical work, because we can tell that the Acts, the account in Acts, which has the 40 day delay is most certainly or at least probably later and the development later because the early Christians generally consider the ascension and the resurrection to be the same event. And you begin having a gap period in the second century in Christians debate. Some, some, some say it was 40 days. Some say it was 180 days. Some say it was three months. Some say it was 12 years. <laughs> so, so they begin, they begin debating how much later is the ascension from the resurrection. And you can tell that's a sec- second century debate because in all these texts, many of them for Nagamati and the preaching of Peter mentions the 12 year thing. 
they're all debating about how much later it took for Jesus to actually ascend, okay? So that's a key indication that Acts is part of the second century debate and that it's revising Luke. Now, in my theory, again, you know, the author of Luke is is late, um, and the first edition of Luke is probably about 100, and he has Jesus ascend very quickly. Uh, you, I mean, you'd never, if, if you just had Luke, you'd never think 40 days. I mean, that's ridiculous. No, he dies, he's resurrected, he's, you know, you see him in Emmaus, and then he appears back in Jerusalem, supposedly as a body, but he can actually teleport. And then the very next scene, bada bing, bada boom, he's raising his hands and floating up to the sky, okay? <laughs> okay, and, and then, you know, the so-called sequel is like, well, you know, actually all this happened 40 days later. <laughs> but right. that sequel is significantly, that sequel tells you that Christians were thinking about this, right? And, and that they had to change the story and that whoever wrote Acts wasn't willing to change everything in Luke to fit what he actually believed. But he, he, he edited Luke in order to make it a basic fit with with his book of acts and then he published it as a two-part you know part one part two part one life of jesus part two early church history that's a sign of a second century editor so here we have i wouldn't call it i wouldn't call it a mistake i would just call it right christian writers who are disagreeing about what actually happened and uh that the the, the disagreement still survives in the New Testament because it's a revised and redacted product that they aren't don't fully make consistent. Mm. And they're not don't feel at liberty to make it consistent because they don't want to change too much. But there you go. I, I hope yeah. that's not too too convoluted. No, no, I, I think uh, everybody's picking up what you're putting down. Bada bing, bada boom, you know, uh, and uh, <laughs> seriously, thank you so much. This has been a blast. I'm sorry for pushing you past our time limit. I do want everybody to know, please go subscribe. Do you see this number here, Dr. Litwa? Thanks so much, guys. Really appreciate it. It's great being on here and it's it's great being a part of a live community here at Myth Vision, and I really appreciate the support. And I, I hope there'll be many uh, live question and answer ses sessions in, in the future. I, I tried to focus it a little bit, but really I, I think probably the AMA Ask Me Anything question uh, will, will just be fine too. So I, I hope you all get to formulate, you know, what, what you want to ask. And, um, and I, hopefully I'll be back on the show sometime soon what are the odds we could get two more people to join entry level doesn't matter you'll be deified eventually uh <laughs> seriously um what are the odds we could get two more patrons right now can i can i hold you for a few more minutes to see if we can get two more patrons absolutely but i <laughs> i don't want any pressure put on anyone now i'm pressuring okay I'm pressuring because your insights are very unique and I want to show you, uh, you know, Hey, we really appreciate you. Seriously. We want you to keep coming back. Never stop coming back. Dr. Little, never stop coming back. What do you, Absolutely. What do you think? I mean, so the first tier is really just basic support. I, I think for, for me, it's, it's Australian $3. I think in the States it's two fifty or less. Um, and then if you join it, if you join at tier four uh, and you're one of the first people to join there today uh, and you want a copy, I'll send you this. It's the paperback copy of Post-Human Post Transformation 2021 book. Um, and uh, do you have let me ask you this. If some other people, let's say they're late to the party and they're like, you know what? I want to join, but I, I want a book. But dang it, you only have two copies of that book. Do you have any other books possibly? on your show absolutely so tier five tier five is is the tier where i send you uh send you one of five books it's the five most recent books that i have so i can send you the evil creator i can send you uh i've got to get that one i've got hermetica two um 
I've got a free copy of How the Gospels Became History, and I've got uh, Found Christianity. So I can send you any of those books in, in addition to Post-Human Transformation um, if you're prepared to join the Tier 5. And it just basically covers my shipping costs from Australia and the price of the book. And I can sign it for you or put any message in it that you want. It ends up, yeah. I can mean, you put, you, this is Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I'll, I'll include like a parchment. Um, we got one more some... joined. One more joined. <laughs> yes. Sorry. I, I will I will include a papyrus, two thousand year old papyrus um, <laughs> that I've dug up from, from Egypt and that I have uh, used some oxidized ink that I have made up. Um, and uh, yeah, it'll be Paul's letter to Alexandria and and you can give it to the apologists and uh, see if they argue for that it's genuine. Because I'll include lots of fun stuff. Um, and uh, stuff that will confirm your confirmation bias. So uh, that will be an extra reason <laughs> to prove authenticity. Uh, Serious. It's it's Paul. It's like really Paul. Like this is his signature on these 2022 books uh, or 2021 or whatever books they might be that you choose from. Like, come on, you know, you know, it's real. No, no. It, you can treat it as an NFT, you know, with my uh, with my personal message to you, uh, if you want. So, um, oh my snap diggity! Oh, bada bing, bada boom, baby! Wow. Okay, yes. well, we, we did better than you expected. Yes. Okay. I this hope we didn't you twist must... anyone's arm. <laughs> I don't think we put any gun to anyone's head or told anyone they're going to hell, did we? I don't think so. Uh, I did talk about deification now. Anyone who's trying to become deified, we but that's part of the gnosis, right? So you're going to be giving that to them, like positive reinforcement. I thanks thanks to everybody who joined, and yeah, to everybody who came today. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, really, it gives me <laughs> gives me lots of courage and uh, and hope for a brighter world and a brighter future. Um, so. Dude, that that's awesome, Dr. Litwell. I really, I'm gonna hit refresh. You just never know. Someone might be straggling. I don't know why I felt like that. Okay. Anyway, uh, seriously, I, I love this. Um, we have a great community. We have amazing people who believe in what we're doing and we're going to keep doing it. I hope this gives you the incentive to say, all right, I'm coming back on to myth vision soon. Don't worry. Absolutely. No, uh, what I think you've created here, Derek, is yeah, something very much like an intellectual platform for really serious people of all different kinds to know that they're hearing information that is is good from good people and i think you worked hard and so absolutely i commend you and i i think it's great this has never been done before uh so thanks for uh, taking that lead thank you seriously i appreciate it and everybody in the chat uh, for all the love, the support, the Q&A, the super chats, the likes on this video, and I will keep them coming. Trust me. Uh, let me just tell everybody what our schedule is looking like right now, and this might change as time goes by. But uh, tomorrow I'll be on with Dr. James Tabor. Tomorrow night I'll be on Gnostic Informant with Apostate Prophet to talk about the origins of Islam. Um, on Thursday, I'm talking to a gentleman named Demos. Demos, I hope I'm saying it right. Um, he's going to go through the development of Greek mythology and Dr. Aaron Adair. Also, this Friday, I'm talking to David Madison, who wrote 10 Things Christians Wish Jesus Never Taught. It's usually like hardcore lessons of like hate your mother, father type stuff, um, which we don't like to hear. And then uh, Dr. Jennifer Bird is coming on, and we're going to be talking about sexuality in the Bible. I think it might be, yeah, something like that in particular. We'll, I'll be knowing more as we get closer. Dr. Justin Sledge next Tuesday. Next Wednesday, Dr. Joseph A.P. Smith. 
Next Thursday, critical faculty, we're going to go into 14 or 13 debunking scientific proofs that the Quran supposedly knew beforehand. Uh, it's always like apologist argumentation. It's convoluted. It's it's a spin. Oftentimes in the English, it's not even meaning what it means in the Arabic. Like there's just so many things. So anyway, that's my little like forecast. And maybe we squeeze you in next week. Uh, I'd like to make that happen. But also, we got to tell them about May, what's happening in May. Give people a tease right now before we get there, right? Yep, I'm going to Derek land. Um, I'm taking a plane, um, going back to the States where I'm from, and uh, be meeting Derek in his hometown and, yeah, putting on uh, a lecture series, hopefully. Uh, we haven't quite chosen the, the topic. I've got a new book on Carpocrates coming out. Um wanting to get information about that, but we may do it based on uh, the Jesus Deus or uh, any other previous book. So if you want your two cents heard and you want to learn more about something specific, by all means, let me know, and we will form that lecture series um, in May, late May. Yeah, late May, we're going to link up. He's coming to me at the house here, actually, and we're going to record. Uh, hopefully we can get some serious... Uh, content recorded have an online course series that helps support dr litwa and what he does helps uh keep us doing what we're doing here and educate you you won't find anything like it out there i could promise you that so there's the tease um any final words to our audience no just thanks to everybody really uh, it, you're golden you're uh amazing and uh it's really heartwarming and i hope yeah you never stop learning and you never stop uh, contributing to Derek and to all those providers who are providing good uh, and really well-researched information. And I hope all of you, yeah, are just never stop asking questions your whole life long. Thanks for being here. Thank you. And never forget, we are Myth Vision. Don't any of you have the guts to play for blood? I'm your huckleberry. That's just my game.